Okay, perfect. So today we're talking about the economics of biocontrol. We've talked a lot about biocontrol in the past few years, primarily because the growth in the industry and the number of producers using it has been um, huge. Um, they can, however, be expensive, and naturally you should know how much you're spending on them and what your return on investment is. But where do you even begin to start? So our expert today is going to walk us through some of that so you can see for yourself. Graham Murphy is an IPM consultant working with the greenhouse industry in Ontario between 1988 and 2014. 1988, Graham? Really? Yeah, I was hardly even born then, it seems. Oh, my God. Well, you're looking good then for that, for how long you've been doing this. My gosh. Uh, he was a greenhouse IPM specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs in Vineland. Ontario, and in that position, he was responsible for advising growers on the use of IPM, applying research results to commercial greenhouse crops, and developing IPM programs with an emphasis on the use of biological controls and ornamental crops. He retired from OMAFRA in 2014 and established the consulting company Biological Control Solutions to provide ongoing support to the industry, making use of his almost 30 years of greenhouse IPM experience. So take it away, uh, Graham. Wonderful. Thank you, Dustin. Um, and and I'm really pleased to be able to be here. So I, I hope uh, that some of the information I, I have can be of, of use to you. I was first asked to give a version of this talk at the Canadian Greenhouse Conference a couple of years ago. And I was given the, the topic, the economics of biocontrol or, or something similar to that. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, but as I was putting together that uh, that presentation, it became abundantly clear to me how limited my knowledge of economics really was. Indeed, I think my bank manager would probably fall over laughing if he knew I was giving a talk on the economics of anything. But what little I do know about economics, I want to talk about for a few minutes, uh, if for no other reason than just to prove my point. I somehow feel that uh, the biocontrol programs can be a little bit like the economy, lots of ups and downs, highs and lows, but certainly over the last 20 years, the trend has been upwards. So here's a brief rundown. I want to I want to begin first with just the scope of economics and starting with with macroeconomics. And this is something that, you know, I've uh, uh, I found, you know, Wikipedia just uh, just very useful for macroeconomics is the big picture, international trade and all that. We're all involved in it. We're all affected by it, but individually, unless we're Donald Trump, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Then we have microeconomics, and this is more at the level of the homeowner or the, the business owner. And again, we're all affected by it, uh, but now we are intimately involved in how it plays out and the decisions we make. Um, uh, sort of directly affect our economic situation. And finally, I've added one more level to this economic hierarchy. Don't take me seriously here, but this is just to emphasize that within the microeconomic running of your greenhouse business, there are subsets of that economy. And in this case, we're talking about the really, really small, microscopically small in many cases. So I have coined the term micro microeconomics to describe the use of anything that requires a microscope to really appreciate and understand what is happening. And in this case, I'm referring to biological control programs. So what would a full economic analysis of, uh, of pest management actually entail? It's very complex and it's not that easy to do. In this particular case, we're trying to determine the net benefits of different pest management options. For example, uh, in this particular case, pesticides versus biological control, so that we can make a comparison between the two. But it's virtually impossible to set up a scientific control or a scientific trial to get a valid comparison. So we need to make a whole lot of assumptions or find ways to measure the costs and benefits. Even things like labor inputs are difficult to compare between a pesticide-based and a biocontrol-based program, because very few, if any growers, at least the ones that I know, have any sort of historical records of their time inputs into a pesticide-based program. So how to make those comparisons? 
The short answer is it'll be very difficult and much of it will rely on assumptions rather than real data. But to get back to what an economic analysis would actually look like, there are several components to the process. Firstly, it involves input costs. They're not that difficult to measure or even to estimate. Basically, they're the cost of labor and materials. Keeping track of those things in real time is not that difficult. Maybe it's annoying, but it's not difficult. The outputs start to become more complicated. What I'm referring to when I talk about outputs in this case is primarily the price we receive for our crops and how that price is affected by pest management issues and decisions. For example, the shrinkage from lost production due to pests and diseases, credits that may be claimed for the presence of pests, reduction in plant quality due to pest damage, disease damage, phytotoxicity issues uh, from the use of pesticides. Ideally, we'd like to be able to measure reduction in prices that we receive due to pest issues and the increase in prices, if that ever actually happens, due to successful pest management. So we then start to get into the, the really difficult items to measure in this column labeled other costs. How do we measure the cost of downtime when we can't enter, enter a greenhouse because of pesticide use or the inconvenience associated with that? What about the liability issues attached to pesticide use? And there are various options within a, a management program apart from just a choice between pests, pesticides and biocontrol. Which pesticides? How frequently are they applied? What are the implications of resistance and the costs associated with that? Which biocontrol agents should we use? And what are the economics of the different options? What if a new pest emerges for which we have no biocontrol options or no pesticide options? What are the costs of those sort of events? As I said, it gets very complicated. So to get to the crux of this presentation, as I've stressed, this is not going to be about the full scope of economics, but rather focusing on some of the input costs associated with biocontrol. I think that as an industry, most growers understand quite well their costs of production when it comes to growing particular crops. In very simple terms, the price we receive for the crop needs to be greater than the input costs, and the greater the difference, the better. Pest management costs are an important part of the cost of production, and while we may have receipts for annual costs of pesticides or biocontrols or monitoring supplies, we often don't understand the breakdown of those costs. So what I want to discuss in the time remaining is how we can gain a better understanding of the when, the where, and the why of our pest management costs, and in particular, biological control. I wanna begin with a quick comparison between single cropping systems and multiple cropping systems. And while that may seem to be uh, going off at a bit of a tangent, uh, I think you'll, you'll understand where I'm coming from when I explain. It's probably easiest to think of a single monoculture crop in terms of vegetable crops, but it could also be a single ornamental crop such as cut Gerbera. The input costs in, uh, are not really that diff difficult to measure either currently or retrospectively looking back over previous years because all the costs are assigned to one crop. The pest and disease spectrum is consistent throughout the greenhouse and inputs are usually the same throughout the production area. Costs can actually be based on greenhouse area, which is often how biocontrol costs in greenhouse vegetables are measured and talked about, price per hectare or per square meter, something like that. It can also be a little easier to measure the output of those crops in terms of yield, perhaps not in terms of price uh, that we receive, which is subject to various market fluctuations, but in terms of volume or weight or even in the case of cup gerbera uh, or some other cut flower crops, the number of flower stems.
However, multiple cropping systems of the type that we see in many ornamental greenhouses, especially in North America, are much more complex, especially if we try to retrospectively analyze our biocontrol costs. We could be talking about spring production with perhaps hundreds of different plant species and contain different container sizes or potted flower produ production, perhaps with some crops being produced on a weekly basis year round and others specifically targeting holidays such as Valentine's Day, Easter, Mother's Day, Thanksgiving or Christmas. Each crop will likely have a different spectrum of pests and diseases and some biocontrol agents likewise target more than one pest. Was that nematode application for thrips control or fungus gnats? Was the predatory mite that was applied for thrips control specifically for crop A or also to crop B that is also attractive to thrips? If we're keeping good records um, sort of in real time with a view to better understanding our input costs, then we can keep track of all that type of information quite easily. But to try to understand it in hindsight without all the information can be a challenge to say the least. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. And even, th even though it can, be, it can be simple to think of the cost of biocontrol in greenhouse vegetables in terms of dollars per square meter or per acre or per hectare, that's not so simple when our production involves multiple crop terms, turns in a year. For, for example, um, a weekly pot of crops per year turned over in the same space, or where there are multiple crops in the greenhouse, each with different levels of inputs, because some are heavy biocontrol users and some require few inputs. Or what about a three-dimensional crop or cropping system with hanging baskets over the top of four-inch spring production? What does a cost per area mean in the above situations? It can really mean one thing only. It's a reference point for that particular greenhouse operation only and can't be compared to any other greenhouses because they are all different. So in general, for the ornamental grower, I find it more useful to think of biocontrol in terms of cost per plant per crop. So for, the, for the, a particular crop on an individual plant basis, I like to bring it back down to that level, or even I know some growers who will do it per cutting. So, to demonstrate my point, as I work through some real life examples in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the cost in ornamentals from both perspectives on an area basis and per plant, just to emphasize the difference, differences between the two, uh, the two perspectives. The other point about multiple cropping systems, how do we measure output in an ornamental crop? There's no easy equivalent to yield uh, in a crop that's grown strictly for appearance. We may be able to do it for some cut flower crops uh, we where we can measure such things as the number of stems harvested uh, or the quality based on stem length. But for container production, plants are either sold or they're not based on appearance, which is very subjective and is the primary criterion for that sale. I just want to kind of shift focus uh, for a, a couple of slides, just to talk about some of the issues in Ontario that led to a major industry-wide shift to biological control since, in, since it's important in consideration of the cost inputs that I'm going to be talking about in a minute. For a number of years, uh, perhaps from the mid 1990s to the mid 2000s, the number of Ontario growers using biocontrol was fairly consistent. It was probably in the range of 25 to 30% of growers. It wasn't that pesticides were doing such an incredibly effective job that biocontrol wasn't needed. It was probably more due to the fact that growers had not yet been forced to understand how best to make biocontrol work. That changed uh, in a big way in 2006 when a new insecticide was registered for the control of thrips. That product was success, the active ingredient is spinosad, uh, which was very effective and thrips populations remained well controlled for several months after application. Two, 
too good to be true and, and for good reason. I started to notice control failure with this product only six to 12 months after it was registered. Why so quickly is another story for another time. But to demonstrate the strength of the resistance, I was working with a grower who suddenly realized that his spray applications of success were not working as well as he was used to. I got him to apply some spray into a small plastic container, knocked some thrips out of his flowers into the container, put the lid on and left it overnight. The next morning, all thrips were still alive and well, and growers quickly came to realize that they had no, no pesticide options left to battle thrips. Within the next one to two years, we saw a wholesale shift to biocontrol in the Ontario ornamental industry, driven almost entirely by the need to control thrips. Growers threw everything at the problem, more concerned about getting control at that point than the cost of doing so. As growers developed their programs, thrips control became better and better. It was helped by new products and innovations in the delivery of the product. For example, the mini sachets of predatory mites that many growers uh, are using in ornamental production. The cost of the programs were still higher than most growers would have liked, who were probably still comparing them to the cost of pesticide programs over the years. But they were much more effective than what they had been achieving with pesticides prior to switching to biocontrol. However, as the programs stabilized and became more consistent, the logical next step was to evaluate how to refine the programs and determine where cost savings could be made without com compromising the level of control. So what I want to present in the remainder of my time is some real data from two Ontario potted plant growers who I've worked with for the last four years. We looked at their biocontrol costs based on inputs only. Remember what I said earlier about the full range of costs and benefits that make up a real and full economic analysis and keep in mind the gaps in that type of analysis as I discuss these inputs. Also bear in mind that comparison between greenhouses should be made very carefully, if at all. The main value in these data is to provide individual greenhouses with their own benchmark to understand their inputs. I also just want to note that the data that I'm, I'm using has been anonymized, if there's such a word, to protect, protect the confidentiality of the growers. Uh, it's real data, uh, but even many of the crops I've just numbered as crops one, two, et cetera, because in some cases, just naming uh, the crops could, could break that confidentiality. So this is what the cropping schedule of one of the growers looked like. This happens to be from 2014, um, uh, but the year is not that important. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of where I started in 2015 uh, when I looked back on the previous year uh, and was just using it to be to be better able to understand and visualize the crops relationships to each other during the course of the year. You can see that crop one for this grower is a weekly program, uh, 52 weeks of the year, it's their bed, bread and butter crop for that grower and in 2014 there was almost 1.3 million pots produced. There are also a number of uh, smaller programs, uh, three or four summer programs, uh, a couple of fall programs, and a couple of spring programs as well. All in all, it's not an unusual type of, of uh, production uh, program for a weekly grower. Grower two uh, is not, was not that different. Uh, I could show you that graphic as well, but it's it, different crops, but the, the graphic itself would not look that much different um, from this particular one. So in 2015, as I, as I started working with these growers, this is how I approached the problem. And, and this here is just a, a screenshot of, of a, a spreadsheet uh, that I was working with. And remember, when we first sat down to try to understand their inputs, the only records we had were a folder full of receipts from the previous year. 
So we sat down and tried as best we could to assign each invoice to a crop and a pest. Uh, the, the weekly invoices in, in this screenshot shown here have been color coded to a specific crop. It took a long time to put this together the first time we did it. Now it's done a little differently from the growers, actually a lot differently, uh, with a spreadsheet where the grower records each input in real time as the product is received and released into the greenhouse. They record the date, the crop or the crops to which it's being applied, the target pest and the cost. It makes life a lot easier to summarize all that data at the end of the year. So in a very simple breakdown, this graph shows the monthly costs of biocontrol inputs for one, just one of the greenhouses. Um, not necessary to, to show you both at this point, um, but uh, if you follow the red line graph, uh, which is, is the, uh, the monthly costs, uh, that's what we're looking for. The, the, uh, the columns below are for individual crops and not something that is important at the moment, but we'll come back to them. There's not a lot of unexpected information in, uh, in this particular uh, graph. It's probably a fairly typical pattern for most greenhouse production systems with the fewest inputs in the winter and peaking in the late summer and the early fall. And in this graph, what I've shown here, I've put uh, both greenhouses on the same uh, on the same graph to demonstrate uh, the total and the per square meter cost for the two greenhouses that I'm working on with this project. You'll immediately notice large differences in both cost measures. Greenhouse one uh, spends between 15 and $20,000, $23,000 per year. These are the blue bars down here for Greenhouse One, uh, the total costs they spend in each of the four years that I've been working with them. Um, the orange line is also for Greenhouse One. That's the average cost per square meter, something in and around um, $1.50 per square meter. The, the total costs are in this left-hand axis and the right-hand axis uh, is for the per square meter costs. Greenhouse two, on the other hand, spends five or six times the amount in total. Again, the red bars this time, uh, you can see up around 140, uh, anywhere between about 110 and $140,000 uh, per year uh, spent uh, in total at greenhouse Two, and likewise, a, uh, a much higher per square meter cost, uh, perhaps four times as much. The green line up here, uh, again, the right axis showing the uh, the cost per square meter. So this goes back to my earlier slide about the complexity of measuring costs in many ornamental production crops, multiple crops, different pest problems, and also the dangers of comparing different greenhouses or production systems. For example, it might be really tempting to simply say that Greenhouse One is much uh, better and more efficient at managing their IPN programs. Uh, much lower costs, uh, everything just you know, seeming to, to go along at a, at a much different level than, than Greenhouse Two. But we have to look more closely uh, at the data to really understand what's going on here. So I've, I've sort of taken the, those total cross, costs, costs uh, and split them down into the cost per crop and the cost per pot. This is for Greenhouse One. And Greenhouse One, if you remember, was that uh, uh, the greenhouse with the 52-week-a-year uh, bread and butter crop. Uh, that, uh, that where I showed you the, uh, the program scheduled for the whole year. So crop one has by far the greatest input costs, somewhere uh, greater than $11,000 for the year. This was in 2017. Um, but you've got to remember crop one was that crop 
1.3 million pots grown in uh, in 2014. By 2017, that that these data represent, they were growing more than two million pots. So when we look at the cost uh, per pot, we might think, yeah, everything was here, but there were so many pots being grown. Even though if we just flip back here, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, which one am I talking about? Well, it was $11,000 for, for that crop one, but on a per pot basis, it was less than a penny per pot. Um, so it was, it was a very, uh, a very efficient crop to do biocontrol in. When we look at some of the summer crops that we, he was uh, growing, uh, this, uh, this orange brown line here, which represents the, the cost per pot, shows that we're up around five or six cents a pot for some of those summer crops. Uh, so just changing what we are measuring, the crop, the cost per crop or the cost per pot, immediately changes our perspective on the cost of the biocontrol program uh, for this greenhouse grower. When we look at greenhouse two, we see a very different picture where the two major crops, which are really just different pot sizes of the same plant, these two blue bars here, make up more than 80% of the biocontrol costs. Um, very big numbers, you know, between 50 and $60,000 for each of those uh, for those crops spent on biological control. And when we look at the, the cost per, per uh, pot of these, of each of these uh, crops, the orange line here, again, greater than 30 cents per pot uh, for the larger pot sizes here, and about 13 cents uh, per pot for the smaller pot sizes. So as I said, I've, uh, Anonymize this data, you don't know what the crops are without really knowing that, uh, you might sort of be throwing up your hands in, in fright and thinking they're horrendous crop, uh, costs. Uh, they are high costs, there's no question, but without really knowing what the uh, the crops are that we're talking about uh, and the value of those crops, it's hard to, to really uh, uh, understand that. But what's really happening with this particular greenhouse? We need to look more closely at what the targets of the biocontrol program for these two greenhouses are. For greenhouse one, the majority of the costs were directed towards fungus gnats, uh, with the other significant pests being thrips and aphids. And of these major pests, it was fungus gnats and aphids that were the primary problems associated with crop one. The smaller slices of this pie represent uh, various minor pests that, uh, that I won't get into discussing today uh, just because of time constraints. But I, what I would say is that the all the costs associated with thrips were directed towards the various summer crops that were being grown and not the major crop that's in that that's being grown in that particular greenhouse. In contrast, Greenhouse 2 has almost 75% of its costs going into thrips control. And if you remember one of the earlier slides when I was talking about the reasons for the rapid and the significant adoption of biocontrol about 10 years ago, thrips was the major driver of that change for many growers. And thrips in general are much more expensive to control than other pests. They require greater inputs, different biocontrol agents, many of which are quite expensive. But when you don't have effective pesticides, as I said earlier, the main focus is on getting control. To further understand some of the differences between these two greenhouses, look at the percentage cost of thrips control compared to other pests over the last four years. Greenhouse two, which is these, uh, these blue bars, um, consistently spends more than 50% of its biocontrol on costs on thrips. And that's been increasing every year. You can see it increasing like that. However, even that we need to treat 
that information carefully as well, because at first glance, that would suggest that TRIPS is becoming an increasing problem. But there's some additional information buried in the data that changes that perspective. In fact, in terms of absolute dollars, TRIPS biocontrol costs for Greenhouse 2 have not changed that much. In, 20, in 2014 and 2015, spider mites were also a major problem that required significant cost inputs. They've become much less of a problem uh, since then. And as the cost of mite control has reduced, it's meant that thrips control is taking up more and more of the biocontrol budget. So it looks as, so the percentage being spent uh, on thrips has increased, even though the total uh, dollars on thrips has not really. For greenhouse one, uh, the red bars here, which is the cost, the percentage cost of their thrips control. Uh, you can see that in, in 2014 and in 2017, thrips control was less than 30% of their uh, biocontrol budget. But in the middle two years here, uh, in 2015, 2016, it jumped to nearly 50%. The grower in the middle two years there was producing a summer crop that was really attractive to thrips. And he finished up spending a lot of money on a relatively minor crop to control that pest. Apart from the difficulty in growing the crop and the shrinkage associated with thrips damage to it, the numbers shown here were a large part of the reason that he's eliminated that crop from his program. The other thing we can do with this information that we collect is to look at exactly what biocontrol inputs are being used. And this gives us some additional guidance about where to look for cost reductions. I'm only showing the information for Greenhouse One to demonstrate what I'm talking about, but it gives you a very clear picture of where the money has been spent on these different biocontrol inputs and how much for each one of them. And allows us to better focus on where we can look at reducing costs based on how expensive uh, those various inputs have been. So what are growers doing to not only reduce the cost of their programs, but also to increase their effectiveness? And if you think about it, increasing their effectiveness is also uh, reducing the long-term cost by reducing shrinkage, uh, by reducing damage associated with pests. There are a number of approaches that I want to talk about briefly before wrapping up this presentation. Firstly, uh, clean start, beginning the, the program with as few pest problems as possible. Secondly, uh, be strategic. And finally, uh, a bit more on IPM generally. Let me begin with clean start. The idea was based on some work at the University of Guelph about 10 years ago. The project was built on grower concerns about the levels of pests coming in on vegetative cuttings especially thrips on chrysanthemums and white fly on poinsettia. They looked at the potential for cutting dips to reduce the starting population and thus, thus make bio, biocontrol programs much more effective. That work was picked up a few years later and expanded on at the Vineland Research and Innovation Centre. And over the past four to five years, they've developed a series of recommendations for cutting dips of poinsettia that can reduce starting whitefly populations by 60 to 70%. They're continuing that work with other pests and crops. But it is becoming quite commonplace in Ontario for poinsettia growers to dip their cuttings and for growers of other crops, such as chrysanthemum, to routinely dip cuttings to control thrips and spider mites. Although the majority of cutting dips are focused on large volume crops, often just single crop systems, uh, such as poinsettia and mums that I mentioned above, there are some growers who are also looking at dipping various spring crops. For example, I work with one grower who dips Ipomoea to control thrips and New Guinea impatiens for control of spider mites and broad mites. And speaking of this last example, clean start does not necessarily have to involve a cutting dip. Many Ontario growers will spray their New Guinea impatiens with a miticide while they're still on the rooting bench, 
before transplanting into larger pots or baskets. Again, this is for control of mite pests, which have a nasty habit of showing up in New Guineas late in the season, just as the growers thinking about shipping. Having to spray at that time would compromise biocontrol for other pests in other crops, but spraying on the rooting bench before Thrips biocontrol programs have been started is cost effective and doesn't impact uh, their biocontrol programs. You have to be aware uh, that dipping cuttings requires care and experimentation. There's a product called Landscape Oil, which is registered in Canada as a cutting dip, and it is very effective at controlling uh, insect pests on plant material. Some crops handle it very well, for example, chrysanthemum, and for others, uh, you will uh, basically just melt them down in 24 hours if you try dipping them in oil. So don't be too cavalier in trying out cutting dips. Experiment carefully with new crops and varieties and follow them through production to make sure there are no ill effects. Secondly, strategic control. What I mean by strategic biocontrol is focusing on those crops and varieties that are most susceptible to different pest problems. That may seem self-evident. We wouldn't think, for example, of using biocontrol for whiteflies on a crop where it isn't a pest, for example, Easter lilies or something like that. But I'm talking about something more subtle than that. Let's take the example of thrips control in spring or bedding plant production. Many spring crops are susceptible to thrips and anyone who's been in the industry for more than 10 years has, I'm sure, experienced what thrips can do to hanging baskets and other container grown crops. Thrips has a host range of hundreds of plant species and it would seem a daunting and very expensive task to protect all that different plant material that could be damaged by thrips during that, uh, that very busy time of the year. But as it turns out, biocontrol of thrips and spring crops has become, become one of the most effective and cost-effective biocontrol programs for Ontario growers. The key has been to focus. Focus on the most susceptible material in the greenhouse. Hanging baskets are the most critical. They're the longest duration crop in the greenhouse at that time of year. They're difficult to monitor and treat once they're hung. They're grown several degrees warmer than bench or floor crops, and that just speeds up the development of pests. And there's the potential for, for any thrips on them to spread rapidly as pupae drop to the crops below. It sounds like a nightmare, and it is if it's not treated. But the other key is to narrow that focus even further. Don't think of all baskets as the same. Thrips have definite preferences and hanging baskets with those plants will always be the main attraction. So that's where the focus should lie. There are probably half a dozen plants that require particular attention. Anything with verbena, ipomea, ivy geraniums, dracaena, biddens uh, should be the primary target. Anything that's usually a, um, a mixed hanging basket, such as the ones shown in this particular photograph here, uh, are going to be um, major targets for thrips. If thrips are well controlled in those crops I've mentioned, our experience has been that other crops will not be affected. Even some crops where we've seen heavy thrips damage in the past, such as New Guineas, Calabrocoa, Scavola, many growers don't bother treating for thrips. All of a sudden, what seems to present as an expensive and complex program becomes much more manageable, both from an efficacy point of view and from an economic point of view. The other situation where strategic use of biocontrol can be important is for pests such as mites, which can, can show marked varietal preferences in crops like potted chrysanthemum. Growers who've had to deal with resistant mites have found it easier to identify the most susceptible varieties, treat the propagation area with a more generalist predatory mite, and then focus on two or three of the most susceptible varieties in short days with more specialist mites such as Phytocelus persimilis. Again, a more effective program at less cost. Finally, I just want to end with a little promo for, uh, for IPM generally and emphasize that biocontrol is simply one part of a broader IPM program. 
and much more effective control can be achieved by attacking pests from multiple directions, uh, which is the, the underlying premise of IPM. And again, more effective control translates to less expensive in the long term with reduced shrink and better quality plants. A couple of things to note. Start early. Biocontrol has to be preventative. And even if you don't see any thrips or white fly or the pest of your choice, but you know that it, is, it, it will always show up on the crop you're growing, then start your biocontrol introductions as soon as possible before you see the pests. It's very difficult for biocontrol to play catch up. Secondly, mass trapping. Large numbers of sticky cards, especially when the pest popula population is low, will slow down the buildup of flying insect pests and make life much easier for your bios. They're cheap and can stay hanging in the greenhouse for a number of months. And finally, don't forget about the potential for other IPM strategies that can help control pests and take some of the pressure off the hardworking natural enemies that you're introducing. Trap plants and banker plants can have their place in an IPM program as well, although you do need to be careful that they're well maintained or they can become part of the problem. As an example, some of you may have heard of the use of eggplant as a trap for whiteflies, and there have been uh, some recommendations at times that it be used in poinsettia crops. Personally, I've tried that many years ago uh, for several years in a row, and I don't think it's very useful at all. The reasons why are for another time uh, and another presentation. But what I do want to emphasize is that eggplant, eggplant can be very attractive to whitefly in some situations. And the photo that I've used here on the, on the, the bottom right shows an eggplant and a crop of mandevilla that had a serious Bermesia whitefly infestation. It worked amazingly well, not only attracting large numbers of whitefly, but also serving as a focal point for natural enemy releases and making it really easy to observe what was happening. As a result, the whitefly problem, which had proven very difficult to control, suddenly became very manageable and at far less cost uh, than had been the case. So just to wrap this up, when we don't have effective pesticides and growers have to find a way to make biocontrol work, the initial response is to do whatever it takes. But at some point, we have to understand exactly where, why, when and how that money is being spent. It allows the grower to measure the inputs associated with different pests on different crops and at different times of the year. To really better understand the complete cost of pest management, we probably also need to include other inputs such as labor and time, the cost of pesticides and monitoring equipment such as yellow sticky cards. But uh, baby steps first and, and sort of getting the, the the, uh, the basic biocontrol inputs and their costs in place uh, is a great starting point to understand uh, our overall uh, cost inputs for the program. Finally, just let me acknowledge the growers who I've worked with who have helped develop these data. I doubt that they're on this, uh, this webinar, but uh, they certainly know who they are. And without them, none of this would have been possible. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Graham. So um, we have a couple questions. First question, do you find, um, are you seeing a lot more growers starting to focus on the dollars and cents behind this? Or is it still, like I, out here, I find it's a, like it's um, kind of remarkably spray and pray in a lot of situations, but yeah. with like hypoaspis or whatever, do you find that it's still that case where people are growers starting to kind of wisen up to the fact that, holy, I, holy crap, this bill is huge. Like, Yeah, I, I think, they are. I, um, I don't know any other growers other than the two that I've, I've uh, used here uh, who, have, who have sort of really, uh, you know, spent a lot of time, obviously, to understand what they're doing. But I would say almost all the growers I'm working with are very aware of the costs and, uh, you know, I'm constantly trying to work with them to find ways to to sort of refine their programs uh, and and sort of bring those costs down, uh, sort of understanding just some of the basics behind the the pests that are 
that cost the most to control, the, the biocontrol agents themselves that are most costly, uh, but certainly sort of a strategic um, focusing of, of you know, where we direct our biocontrol efforts uh, makes a, a big difference. Cool. Um, just to your uh, just your question there about or your um, comment there about the um, eggplant. Um, mm. As a bank, we've got a grower who's growing. Uh, he's typically used mule and the mule and banker plant system yep. with diciphus, and yes. they started growing um, started growing eggplant this year just to try it with with the diciphus and see if it would um, if it would be there happy just as happy on there as on the mulen and they've been fantastic they've had great luck um and then they also have a saleable product in the fact that they have these fantastic eggplant so so they're growing the the eggplant as a as a sort of a patio planter or or are we talking about uh commercial eggplant production sorry no this is a ve commercial vegetable producer but yeah the, okay. where they've typically where they've typically had their their mule and baker plants along the wall they just yep. have put in some eggplant just to try it out and they they seem to be just as happy there but then they've also they're also getting a product out of it so it's almost kind of a two okay. for one deal there okay. um uh spraying miticides on the rooting bench do the residues affect biocontrol later in the season uh they don't appear to uh you know growers will often use something you know like avid or um or pylon or something like that and if they, if it's if it's done on the propagation bench uh, you know, you're dealing with a, you know, a very small plant at that point, you can get good coverage uh, and it's very, uh, it's very efficient because you have such uh, intensive production all crammed together in a very small area. Uh, and, you know, it's still on a rooting bench, uh, you know, after the application is still under mist, it's warm temperatures uh, and, you know, those products will break down after a few weeks by the time they're transplanted. Uh, you know, you're really only treating, uh, in, in this particular case that I was talking about, the, the New Guinean patients. And, you know, as they're, they're usually grown in baskets, sort of as a, uh, uh, you know, as a single crop, uh, not often in, in mixed containers. Um, so they don't, they don't get, th you know, the growers I work with don't apply thrips biocontrol to those uh, to those New Guineas, they're they're really left to their own devices once they're up in the air, so there's no uh, no impact on biocontrol programs. Okay, uh, and then there was a, there's a question here about um, horticultural oils or insecticidal soap that uh, I haven't had any luck finding horticultural oils or insecticidal soap that are labeled for cutting dips. Any recommendations? There's only one that I'm aware of, and that's landscape oil. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure that has cutting dips on the on the label. Okay. We had um, Debbie um, Dip and Debbie from BioWorks out um, last week or the week before, I guess, for our workshop, and I didn't realize that actually the whole um, Nematode Botanigard um, dip that that wasn't actually registered for cuttings in Alberta as a cutting dip. That was news to me, but. No, Botanigard is not registered. Nematodes uh, is not uh, is not an issue because it's not a pesticide and they don't have to be registered. Okay. Um, as far as soaps are concerned, uh, I think I'm, I, unless something has changed recently, I don't think cutting dips are on the label for that either. But uh, from what I understand, that that use is in the system uh, and uh, you know, hopefully will be added to the label fairly soon yeah um, she said they were they she said they were working on it I, sh I think she said that also that the the vineland videos that had like a a disclaimer that yes. use that on risk basically <laughs> well yeah i mean yeah the work on at, at vineland on poinsettias was done with uh, uh, a mixture of soap and botanicard uh and both of those products they are uh are being uh you know that that label is being worked on to expand it to include those those uh, those uses. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, um, you went through a list of six focal crops for thrips control. Could you mm -hmm. uh, just go over those again? Sure. Where are we? Do 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 do. Uh, 
Yeah, the ones that I was uh, the ones that I was talking about that that I would say are the most critical for our growers here, and it's and it doesn't mean they're the only ones, but verbena, ipomea, ivy geraniums, dracaena. So they're the spikes that finish up in the you know the middle of so many mixed baskets. Mm. Uh, biddens is mm. the other one. Uh, as I said, there are others. Uh, there are bench crops um, uh, as well that you know, may not be grown so much under, uh, you know, in basket situations, uh, but say for four inch production or, or smaller container sizes, dahlia, uh, marigold, some verdure uh, are all uh, crops that I would seriously consider, um, you know, sort of directing some biocontrol efforts towards on the bench. But I think there are many that uh, we don't we don't have to. Everyone's crop mix is going to be different, and there may be some, you know, some other crops in there as well. And that's that's my disclaimer. <laughs> For sure. Um, regarding mass trapping, is there any concern about um, collateral damage? I guess with your with your bios. It's it's a good question. The doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah uh, the the slide that I I showed uh, showed large blue sticky cards uh mm -hmm. for, for mass trapping and and blue uh is you know has, has long been thought of as as sort of maybe more attractive to thrips uh i think the jury is still uh, a long way out on that uh you know i've done some some personal trials you know 20 25 years ago and i know others have as well and it seems that there are times of the year or there are some crops where blue may be better than yellow and at other times yellow may be better than blue. Uh, I think the, the, the other thing about, uh, you know, blue versus yellow is that, you know, blue is considered to be less attractive to some of the flying natural enemies, such, you know, like the parasitic wasps. Uh, so you would catch fewer. Um, I'm not 100% sure just whether even using yellow would be that detrimental. I mean, the thing is, we're not, I, I don't think we've ever eliminated a pest population uh, with mass trapping or monitoring cards. Uh, and I doubt that we will with, uh, you know, we would eliminate the uh, the biocontrols as well. But if if you do have a program with, with you know parasitic wasps as a large part of it then uh yeah you might be better to try blue but i've also seen situations where blue just didn't catch anything mm. uh and so you know you it might be something that you kind of want to uh put up equal numbers of both and just look at them to see which one's being more effective uh in your particular situation and different colors of blue can make a difference as well so uh, again, uh, it, 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 there's no, there's no sort of uh, you know completely right answer to that one. Uh, yellow in general is is yeah sort of uh, uh, you know catches a broader spectrum of, of uh, insects, uh, including pests. Um, but you know when when thrips is the primary pest, I think I would rather uh err on the side of catching more thrips even if it meant catching some bios for some of the other pests because other pests can be controlled either with compatible pesticides or you know there are other options available to us so i think there's more benefit to be gained from mass trapping uh than uh you know the, the alternative hmm. sure okay um, we don't ha we don't have a ton of growers who are growing um, I guess ornamentals you know going from one cycle to the next all like mm -hmm. all year round um, yeah. so I mean and we are also blessed with this ridiculously cold climate um, yeah. so I mean most of our greenhouses freeze out but for the growers that you got that you deal with that are you know that are going from bedding plants to poinsettias to you know bedding plants again how are they yeah. how are you working with them on um, like on, on starting clean and on sanitation and whatnot? 
Yeah, I mean, many of our growers don't ever have the greenhouse empty. Uh, and, and so that becomes difficult. Uh, so, as I said, you know, a lot of growers are, are moving towards dipping of cuttings, especially for crops like poinsettia. Um, you know, weekly chrysanthemums uh, are another one. Uh, we don't see a lot of carryover from poinsettia, you know, pests that are in poinsettia into bedding plant crops. So the, the, the poinsettia crop sort of almost acts as a, uh, uh, you know, as a barrier to carryover of, of pests. Um, you know, really the, the major pest on poinsettia is whitefly and we never see uh, Bermesia whitefly showing up in, in, uh, in our bedding plants. So that's not uh, um, as, as big a deal. It's, it's more just about awareness. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the cutting dips are fine, but they're not suitable for every crop. And so it's a matter of, of starting early. And, and that is, you know, often as soon as the, as soon as the plants are stuck and on the rooting bench. Hmm. Okay. Um, what about enhan enhancing the attractiveness and selectivity to uh, to thrips of tra bleh, bleh, sorry Ken. Um, so what about enhancing attractiveness and selectivity uh, to thrips of the traps using vanilla? Yeah, um, there are a number of attractants. V vanilla has certainly been, uh, you know, there there is some evidence to suggest that it's a, that it is attractive. Uh, there are a couple of pheromone or um, uh, the floral attractant uh, available from one of the, the companies as well uh, that, you know, are sold for the same purpose. You have to be a little bit careful. And I know there's been some work done at Vineland that suggests that, that pheromones, I'll just kind of lump them all in as a, as a sort of a generic pheromone uh, designation. Uh, there's some work to suggest that it, they can be more effective in, in catching more. I think a, there's a lot we don't know about them. And, and a, a lot, in large part, that would be how much do you, you know, do you put one on every single trap? Uh, does that create some kind of fog of pheromone or attractant in the greenhouse? And it means that uh, there's no, uh, there's no sort of uh, target for the thrips to aim at. Uh, you know, if you just if you just have one uh, trap in the middle of a, a, a greenhouse that's that has you know a, a, a cotton ball soaked in vanilla or pheromone on it, then there's there's a very uh, perhaps a very clear gradient of concentration of that attractant back to the to the particular uh, um, you know, trap card. Whereas if you were to put them all out there, uh, I, I don't know if the same thing's going to happen. When I say I don't know, I really don't know. It may be that it's going to work uh, just fine and, and, and be better, but uh, th there's a lot that we still don't know about how to best use uh, those, uh, those sort of attractants in the greenhouse. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that potentially by having, you know, cotton balls soaked in vanilla or whatever on your traps throughout the greenhouse, you're more just creating like a haze of vanilla rather than like, a, you know, a cookie crumb. It could you know. be. <laughs> it could be that. I mean, that's, that's you know, me speaking as a person and not me thinking like a thrips. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I, as I said, I really don't know how a thrips would perceive that. But I mean, if you look at, uh, say, in uh, some fruit crops, outdoor crops, there is a, um, a control strategy called mating disruption, where they put uh, pheromones throughout an orchard, you know, in a fruit crop, for example, uh, with the very idea of creating confusion uh, in there so that, that males um, can't find the, the females uh, in amongst a, like I said, a fog of pheromone that's within that uh, within that orchard, and so something, yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, it wasn't something I sort of made up in my head. There is some basis in in why I said that, but I just don't know for sure if the same thing applies 
uh, in a greenhouse situation. For sure. Okay. Um, any recommendations for using? Oh God, I'm not going to butcher this word. Um, things like Botanic Garden Met 52 in cool foggers. Entomopathogenic pathogenic products. There, nailed it. Yeah. Um, cold foggers are great for Botanic Garden. Um, the the other the other uh, way of applying them is. Uh, through a high volume sprayer at very high pressure and moving very quickly through the crop so that you're creating, a, a, you're almost sort of spraying it out over the top and allowing it to drift down onto the, the crop. It's, it's that particular product it, on the label, it sort of says spray to glisten or something like that, not to run off because that's just wasting product. So you know, you have to be careful. You can't always mix it with, say, nematodes, which requires a much lower pressure. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you're often looking at getting it into the soil and things like that. So, um, yeah, Botanigard, uh, if you're going to do it high volume with a high volume sprayer, it, it has to be done on its own and with this very high pressure. But it is compatible with low volume applications. The, the thing about MET52, and Michael Brownbridge at, at Vineland has done a lot of work with these, uh, these microbial products, MET52 is a much larger spore size uh, from what I understand compared to Bavaria, uh, which is in Botanigard. And the, the droplet sizes in a cold fogger are very small, and I'm not certain whether uh, the... the uh, uh, they would hold the larger spore of MET52, the Metarhizium fungus. Uh, if you want, I can I can sort of confirm that with with Michael uh, just to get his thoughts and and uh, send you his response on that, Dustin. And you can either send it out to all the. Sure, I'll just get the I'll just get the um, the gentleman that asked the question there to email me. You heard it here first, um, Jeremy. If you want to email me your question and um, or email me your email address and um, and I'll hook you up with Graham there. Uh, and if, so you mentioned high, you mentioned hanging baskets as a, as a hot spot that um, kind of gets stuck yeah. up there and never looked at again. What yeah. um, where else in the greenhouse do we need to be looking in particular? Or like scouting, I guess. Where should we pay, be paying a lot of attention? Uh, yeah, it's. It, I, I I take it you're, you're talking mainly about spring production here. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, the my experience has been baskets are the the number one, two, and three priority for uh, for biocontrol in spring. Uh, you know, the, the, all the all the various reasons I gave for that, they're, they're in the greenhouse for the longest. You know, it's a, you know, maybe a two and a half month crop compared to a lot of the bench crops that maybe, you know, sort of uh, depending whether it's plugs that are being sold um, or, you know, sort of smaller pot sizes, they may only be six weeks or something like that. Just putting them up out of sight where they are difficult to monitor and they're difficult to treat um, and they're, they may be, you know, three degrees warmer than crops that are on the floor or on a bench. So you get this much more uh, rapid development of, of pest problems like thrips. And thrips, when they pupate, they drop. So they drop to the crops that are underneath in that particular oh. problem that, uh, that finishes up throughout the greenhouse. So... Oh, did we lose you for a minute? Oh, we, I, yeah, we, we did lose you for a minute, but you're back. Okay. Um, did you miss any of that that was important? I don't know how much you missed. I, I, th I think we I think we lost we lost a bit after the after baskets. So it kind of anywhere where it could be potentially warmer is what I'm getting from this. Yeah, yeah potentially warmer, like two to three degrees at least warmer. You know, if it's hung, depending on how high they're being hung. Uh, you know that. Uh, that, uh, you know, just allows uh, pest populations to develop much more quickly. And uh, pests, pests such as thrips pupate, and when they pupate, they drop, uh, either drop from the plant 
uh, either onto the soil or in the case of baskets to the crops below. So you've got all these, you know, you've got all these factors associated with hanging baskets that say, put your focus there. Um, yes, there are other crops that you may have lost. You there? Yeah, there you are again. <laughs> okay, I'm not quite sure what's happening. Maybe my audio jack is uh, is loose or something. Um, yeah, there are all sorts of, uh, as I said, some other crops there that you just know are super sensitive to thrips, and you may want to do something in there as well. Uh, but I work with growers and uh, who who just leave a whole lot of crops that you would just uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I would have said, you know, they're thrips magnets. Um, but often they're only thrips magnets when there is an out of control population, uh, you know, sort of where throughout the, uh, the the greenhouse and they're just spilling over into some of these other crops as well. As I said, thrips have a host range of hundreds of plant species, but there is a, a, a very definite preferences. Hmm. Okay. Cool. So once again, um, thanks to you, Graham, for a wonderful presentation. And thanks to everybody who took the time out of your busy day to listen. Um, this is our last webinar of the season. So we'll take this time to wish you all the best in the upcoming uh, season and your growing adventures. And stay tuned for information on next year's. Have a great rest of your day, folks. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. Okay. Bye.